FX's new epic series Shogun thrust us into the heart of 16th century Japan, the land of fierce warriors, clashing cultures, and a whole lot of power struggle. But before we break down samurai swords as well as forbidden romances, let us untangle the web of history and break down the hierarchy of power, who are the council of regents, what's up with the Christian daimyos, the effects of Spain and Portugal in this story as well as global history, as well as the arrival of John Blackthorne and how he changes the entirety of this story. And we're gonna dive into the city of Macau and its significance in this show because there's a lot of moving machinations in this series, a lot of terms that we need to understand, the hierarchy of power, shogun, daimyo, just what is even a daimyo. All of these will be broken down in this video as we dive deep into the world of shogun and explain it all. And guys, I'm Shalon. Welcome to the Bin Zone. And on today's video, we're breaking down Shogun. While the series Shogun is fascinating and the story gripping, it's leaving a lot of fans confused. And that's because the story itself takes place in 16th century Japan. And in order to understand Shogun fully, we have to understand what's happening in Japan at this time. In the 1600s, Japan in the 1600s is recovering from a war with Korea. And at this time, Christianity, specifically Catholicism, is being spread throughout Japan via the Portuguese because during this time period, Portugal was the first European power to settle on Japan and begin spreading Christianity. While the Europeans thought Japan was a land of savages, Japan in itself was a bustling society with its own hierarchy of power. So let's look at this hierarchy of power and sitting on top of Japan's power is the emperor. However, in the show Shogun, they never specifically mention the emperor by name because at this point in history the emperor himself is nothing but a figurehead and the daimyos themselves have all the real power so if the emperor is a figurehead we have to go down the hierarchy of power to see who's next in line after the emperor and after the emperor the next person who is of the most significant power in japan is actually the shogun think of the shogun as commander-in-chief of all the military might in japan they hold the real power while the emperor is a figurehead but in this time period, there is also no shogun. And because of centuries of infighting and power struggles, the shogunate itself has been vacated. So the emperor has no power. There is no shogun. The taiko who died is not the shogun, nor is he the emperor. The taiko in this series is the advisor to the emperor. He is the one with the actual political power, and he is the one that advises the emperor or advises the emperor, as he is the one that's actually running Japan in the absence of a shogun and with the figurehead of an emperor. So once the Taiko realizes he's about to die and his heir isn't ready to take power, he creates the Council of Regents. And the Council of Regents is the five daimyos with the most power in Japan at this point. For us to understand the significance of it, let's think of daimyos as great houses of Japan at this time, the five most powerful lords of the country, and everyone beneath them are smaller lords. In Game of Thrones terminology, Think of them as the Lannisters, the Starks, the Baratheons. Those are great houses. So therefore the five daimyos who are on the council are the biggest houses. And then you could think of the other daimyos as lesser lords. So you see the hierarchy of power. Lesser lords, higher lords, the Taiko, Shogun, and then the emperor. But in this power vacuum, there is no emperor. The Taiko is dead. So now it's the five great houses sitting as a council managing the power of the country. And just who are these five great daimyos who are on the council? The main daimyo we're following and the main character of Shogun is Yoshi Terunaga, who is of the Minonaro bloodline, therefore has legitimate claims to be Shogun even though he doesn't want to. And because of this bloodline, we see throughout the show, he explains to us during his childhood how he's exchanged from great house to great house as a hostage. And it's during this time period that he actually begins to amass power. Because being a hostage and going from house to house, he's able to form alliances and people recognize and respect his legitimate bloodline. And that's how he's able to rise to power and become the daimyo of the Kanto region. And within the Kanto region, his palace is the Edo Palace. And Edo is modern day Tokyo. To give you a grasp of just how powerful he is, he was in charge of modern day Tokyo, the entire Kanto region. And with the death of the Taiko, he has the most legitimate claim to being Shogun and the ruler of Japan, which is what puts him in stark opposition to his main political rival on the council, Ishiro Kazunaru, who is also a great and powerful lord in his own right, but he does not have 
the bloodline to become Shogun and therefore he must eliminate Toronaga in order for him to consolidate power because he also understands with the Taiko being dead the vacuum of power is his for the taking and overall while his character is in stark opposition to Toronaga I do not believe that he is necessarily evil he just wants power for himself and he thinks he knows what's best for Japan as opposed to letting Toronaga have it which is why he has such a tense relation because he knows how powerful Toronaga's bloodline is and the fact that Toronaga was expanding his power, arranging marriages with different daimyos and different feudal lords in order to conglomerate and consolidate power under him puts him as the most likely candidate to rule Japan and Ishido does not want that so he is able to turn the rest of the council members against Toronaga and just, just dive into just the rest of these council members because the next two are the biggest threats to Japan as a whole and the fact that they're Japanese is mind-blowing that they are inviting the very thing that wants to destroy their way of life. And the first one we're going to talk about is Kiyama Ukan Saranaga, a Christian lord who converted into Catholicism not mainly because of faith but also because of the Portuguese offering him wealth, weapons and giving him power because the Portuguese have their own agenda but he doesn't care as long as he's able to consolidate power and have enough power to eventually take Japan with Christian backing he's willing to sell out his own country for his newfound faith and it's not just him it's also Ono Harunobi another Christian daimyo who has leprosy and because of his leprosy he converted to Christianity in hopes of saving his soul saving himself and because he drank the Kool-Aid of Christianity him and Kiyama are aligned to allow the Portuguese to bring support, bring weapons, spread Christianity because the Portuguese are going to prop them up and make them powerful. So are they really Christians because of their undying faith or ultimately is this just a game for them in order to amass power and because while they're great lords they have less power than Ishido and way less power than Toronaga. They know they can't win by traditional means but aligning themselves with Europe and Christianity gives them a fighting chance in order to take over Japan. And the last great lord is Sugiyama. Sugiyama is the richest of them all. Think of him as a Lannister. His family has been in power for centuries. He is the richest. He has the money, the funds, but he's neutral. He doesn't care about Christians. He doesn't care about Toronaga's cause. He's just making sure that his power and his family, his line can continue and that's how Ishido is able to get him to join. Because he aligns himself with Ishido, he's essentially funding Ishido while securing his power base. It would have been smart for him to join Toronaga but Ishido also had the support of the Christian daimyos because they know individually none of them could be Toronaga's forces, his brilliance but combined the council is able to check Toronaga and that is what's creating a fractured Japan. All these daimyos fighting for their own power, their own self gain while the Portuguese themselves are using this as a way to spread their influence throughout Japan. And under the council we have regular daimyos. One of these daimyos is Kashigi Yabushige. And Kashigi Yabushige is the lord of Izo. Izo is a city and province in Japan that falls under the Kanto region so therefore he is a lesser lord to Toronaga. He swore his fealty to Toronaga, Toronaga swore his fealty to the emperor and that's how the power works and the fact that Yabushige sees that Toronaga is on his way out of the council he sees that as an opportunity to rise in power himself. With Toronaga out the way his clan is able to then take control of the Kanto region and become a council member of the council of region and that's what Ishido sees. He sees his greed and he sees that he's able to manipulate Yabushige in order for him to help him depose of Toronaga. So while he swears fealty to Toronaga, he also wants and covets Toronaga's seat and his power. And under him is his nephew Kashigi Ume. Kashigi Ume is another lesser lord. So you see how the hierarchy works? Lesser lord, lesser lord, higher lord, higher lord, shogun, emperor. And under Damyo comes the next highest position and that's the position of Karo such as Hiromatsu and a Karo is the highest class of samurai you can get to and therefore as the highest class of samurai you serve as the advisor to your Damyo. Think of a Karo as a lesser Shogun. The Shogun serves at the behest of the Emperor and the Karo serves at the behest of their Damyo. And under the Karo is the Samurai. The Samurai are the working class warriors but not just regular warriors. But to be a samurai is a form of nobility. Not just anyone can become a samurai. You can't just grab a sword and say, I'm a samurai. 
you have to have some level of nobility. It, you have to serve a daimyo, and therefore that is your hierarchy. There usually are the officers in the army, the most skilled fighters of the army. Essentially, they are the captains, the colonels, any rank authority in the army are usually samurai. And another class of samurai is called the ronin. Ronins are samurais without masters. Ronin are samurai who are not of nobility. They're wandering warriors, almost if not just as skilled as samurai, but they have no allegiance. And they will play a crucial part in the story because ronin are also mercenaries for hire and they have and understand the tactics of samurais, which is something the Portuguese are utilizing very well. And under the warrior classes, you have the regular classes. You have the merchants who stir the economy, as well as the peasants who are just everyday people. And under all of that, then you have women. Because as you see in Japan, the hierarchy is very male-centric, male-dominated, and women sit at the bottom of the totem pole. Granted, higher-born women, wives of daimyos, wives of samurais, have more power than say your average peasant but nonetheless they really don't have any power when it comes to men they just have the favor of people in power those samurai shoguns because they're wives or sisters of those men therefore they have some prestige but on their own no power no sort of political any machination in Japanese culture during this time. And with that understanding of just how fractured Japanese society is at the time and their power structure, you see how it is easy for the Portuguese to therefore spread their message throughout and take Japan for themselves. Because during this time period as well, during global history, it's a very interesting time. You see, Spain and Portugal divided the world in half because they had the most superior naval power at the time, Spain took the Americas and Portugal took Asia. Therefore, the two European powers divided the entirety of the world with two specific treaties that carved the world up just for them and excluded every other European power. That is the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494. And when Asia was discovered, the spices of Asia and the Silk Road was also made public and they were able to get to Japan and China. They created the Treaty of Zarangoza, which therefore divided the world evenly while Spain got the Americas. That's why you see Latin America, the Caribbean, Florida, all these places are heavily Spanish influenced and Portuguese got Asia, blocking all other European powers from getting there. And that's when we're introduced to our main character, John Blackthorn. John Blackthorn is an Englishman sailing under the Dutch because the Dutch at the time had a powerful navy, but because of the monopoly that Spain and Portugal held over the world, they could not establish trade directly with Asia. But they had to go through Macau and Portugal set the terms. So Portugal was able to go to Japan, go to China, trade, get favorable trade, and then price gouge the rest of Europe. And if we know one thing about colonial powers, specifically the Dutch, French, and English, nothing was going to stop them from becoming global superpowers. So they had to find a way across to Japan. And the, the most direct way to Japan would be to sail east. But because of Portugal's bases and their checkpoints and the fact that they were not going to allow any other European power into Asia, you could not get to Asia that way. So John Blackthorn had to go through Asia the long way. And when I mean the long way, he had to sail from England all the way through America, go under South America, come out behind and then from South America sell through Asia. The longest possible journey, but the only journey that he could go on to avoid detection from the Portuguese and Spain. Because he spoke some Portuguese, he could masquerade himself as a Dutch merchant vessel through the Americas and that's how he was able to get from London to the Americas and go through Magellan's Pass. Magellan's Pass is very treacherous to navigate because you have to cut through South America and go under, around, and come out the other side of South America. A very dangerous journey. And then from there, once you set sail from Chile, South America, your next destination is Japan. No stops. This journey is insane. But John Blackthorn was able to make his way to Japan, landed in Izu, and that's when Yabushige found him and they brought him to Toronaga. And with the understanding of just who Toronaga is and him understanding that soon the regents were going to vote him out, he was going to lose his power and lose all of his ability, he needed a way to fight the Christians. But he had no other methods, no other way. He, all they knew of Europe was the Portuguese. And once John Blackthorn made his way there, it opened a whole new world. With his Dutch ship, the Aramis, landing in the Kanto region, Toronaga was able to befriend Blackthorn, learn his ways, understand the difference between 
Catholicism and Protestants have European weapons because at this time, because Portugal was the only trading partner to Japan, the only way they could get European weapons, guns, any sort of supplies to help them combat them was through the Portuguese. But the Portuguese only aligned themselves with the Christians. You had to convert in order to get their help. And Toronaga is fiercely Japanese. Ishido is fiercely Japanese and has pride. But with the arrival of Blackthorn, they had other means to trade with Europe. And Blackthorn's arrival opened up Japan. Toronaga found this as his way to fight against not only Ishido, but the Portuguese backed other daimyos. And because of John Blackthorn's arrival, Toronaga saw this as a way for him to use another European power to rid himself of the Portuguese support that the other daimyos had. And therefore, using global powers, even though Toronaga had never left Japan, has no idea of the global landscape of Europe at this time, his genius was able to have him understand how warring powers work, use another European power in order to set the stage for a lengthy civil war. Because this series is going to cover Toronaga's ascension to power and how he's going to use his smarts, his wits, and use European powers against each other. Using the Protestant and Catholic hate against each other, he's able to He's going to find a way to save his country from outside influences. And that is the groundworks to Japan. That is the history behind it. Those are the powers at play. Various different machinations. Blackthorn's there for his own personal gain. Toronaga is for his and Japan's. So is Ishido's. The Christians are one faction. So you have various warring factions. Traditional Japan, Christian Japan, Portuguese Catholicism, and English Protestants four major superpowers converging on this small nation in a war that will decide the fate of the future of Japan. And this is based on actual history. While the novel itself is based on things that have happened, names were changed of course, but this is really, a, you could look at it as a true story because it is what happened in Japan in the 16th century. But guys, that's just the breakdown of this. I'd love to hear your feedback. Do you like Shogun as much as I do? Because it's been my favorite show of the last two years. I can't get enough of it. But I'd love to hear your questions in the comment section below. And guys, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and until next time, binge on.